Our, our next speaker is Christian Kirsting, um, who's been doing a wonderful work on uh, probabilistic programming and its intersection with logic programming. Um, <clears throat> thanks. So actually, I have to complain. Because first of all, I learned a lot yesterday, and I was not expecting so much learning. But I'm really complaining to give a talk after Stuart and Josh. <laughs> because what can I do now? I mean, I'm screwed. But I also want to thank you for that, because I was never expecting to be in one session with these two guys and also with you, Frank. So it's really a big, big honor for me. So I, I hope I'm not completely disappointing. So um, actually, in the, in the program, I had a different um, title. But yesterday, I thought I should change somehow. So my idea is to talk a little bit about probabilistic programming, but also maybe showing um, that there are still some issues to be solved. Um, but there's also a lot of done, uh, stuff has been done already to, to do that. So yesterday, for example, we heard a lot about just um, imperative probabilistic programming. But now imagine that you get all this fancy data um, that is typically stored in a relational database. And one of these examples are electronic health records, where we did a lot. And now you have to condition on the relational database you have, right? So you're a medic. You're asking, what is the, prob uh, what is the probability to have a certain disease um, given the whole electronic health record of a person? So yesterday, I got the impression also during the poster um, session that people feel like there is um, structural learning, but it's so hard. So I fully agree that structural learning is hard, but you can still do it. And so what we were doing a lot, and maybe we can also turn that into for, um, probabilistic programming languages that are more um, imperative. So we were following a boosting approach, a functional gradient boosting approach, where you're not trying to learn a single line of your code one after the other, but you're actually trying to learn several of these rules, always a little step, uh, keep going like that. So what you see here is then part of a model that was learned on the cardiac health studies. So it's about um, detecting or predicting heart, um, heart attack risk, right? Um, so, and it, it completely makes sense. So for example, the first decision is about whether you're male or female. And we know then from, from the standard literature in, in uh, the medical literature that um, females have a lower risk of heart attacks. So the um, subtree for females is much less complicated than for males. But then actually when you marry, you lose this advantage. Anyhow, there, there's a lot of interesting <laughs> statistics going on. But I wanted to point out is that with a little bit of gradient boosting, um, you can actually learn these kinds of models on an electronic health record on a full database within nine seconds, right? So just want to let you know, I'm not saying we are solving structural learning here. Um, Stuart was pointing out uh, a lot of interesting issues there. Um, Josh was pointing out super interesting problems. But I just want to say it's not that there's nothing. So you can do something, and it's not taking, taking ages. And if you would like to know more about that, because that's what I learned yesterday in the session on uh, unheard voices. So I'm not pretending that we are unheard voices. But I just want to say there are tons of tutorials. Here's our NIPS tutorial, but there are others out there on all these kinds of techniques. And there are even books. Um, so you can also check Lisa Gutur's and Ben Tusker's book. But you can also check our ones. And if you want to try out, there are even toolboxes out um, where you can do that in Java, but also in Python. So it's super easy to integrate. And you also have um, natural language interfaces um, to put the human into the loop in an easy way. So in a sense, we can say probabilistic programming is great. But um, after we did all this work, I was wondering, OK, but now what happens if I want to feed this database into a support vector machine? Right? So we hear a lot about probabilistic programming. But I think we have to get the whole toolbox of AI and machine learning um, involved. So the main problem is that you can't do it in the traditional way. Um, actually, I don't know how many of you are still working with support vector machines. Uh, you don't like, actually, um, to work with this standard algebraic view. Because if you work with a database, you have to think about indexing. And it's getting really hard to do that. So what we did is we developed a more declarative um, language for mathematical programming for linear and uh, quadratic programs. So here you can almost directly translate the paper form that you saw here 
um, into program code, and then the underlying compiler is taking care of indexing and everything, right? So you still have somehow at least a shallow semantics of what is the meaning um, of single um, symbols. And then actually, um, you can try to make use of the fact that typically you have a lot of data, but your model is rather small, so you're expecting some form of symmetries in there. So maybe we can speed up, and this is what um, 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 Stuart was talking about, and while he is fully correct, if you look at the theory of lifted um, inference, then typically they try to get an exponential um, reduction in a sense, right? So wherever you take uh, exponential time, they would like to scale linearly. Um, if you're a little bit more relaxed, and I'm more relaxed there at least, and you're just interested in getting some speed up, if you can speed up Groby by 50%, I'm happy already, right? So if you do that, then you can actually show that you can run a rather simple algorithm that is known from the 70s and maybe even earlier, going back to Tarjan, um, to figure out what is called a uh, fractional automorphism of your mathematical program, and then you can collapse um, automatically. And this can give you speed up in terms of modeling. So here you see on a very simple link prediction task that instead of publishing 10 or 20 papers where you always go for very specific graph kernels, you can just add these two lines of um, constraints saying, okay, if two papers are on citing each other, they should be on the same hyper, uh, side, uh, side of the hyperplane. Um, if I want to classify them, just two lines of codes and you're on par with all these very specific and hand-tailored um, collective classification approaches. On the other hand, you see here um, that noise is not a problem, uh, might not be a problem. So typically people say, um, if you put a little bit of epsilon on top of your data, you're destroying all symmetries, and that's true. But you can develop now that you have an algebraic understanding, you can um, develop approximate lifting up approaches. So this is very much related to clustering in a sense. And then for SVMs, for example, you can develop based on that pack learnability results, so you get guarantees on the future performance. Additionally, you get speed ups, right? So here we are just doing data augmentation, but then um, when you take your image and you rotate it a bit and you rotate it again and so on and so on, um, you're now computing approximate symmetries in this huge space data space you have there. And that's done automatically, and you get a speed up now overall of 300, almost 400 times, but still getting the same result as the original SVM. And because it's algebraic, it should extend to deep learning. There's actually some nice papers now out uh, from the CMU guys. So again, if you want to try out, this is all implemented, and this lifting, this, um, I haven't explained how to do that, but it's a standard algorithm, and it's taking just um, quasi-linear time. So why were we interested in that? Well, with that, you know, there was a lot of um, hype going on on how can we exploit symmetries in algorithm A, how can we exploit symmetries in algorithm B, and so on and so on. So here we were now able to prove in a um, principled fashion that all of these algorithms that are based on linear programs or quadratic programs can make use of symmetries. And it takes only quasi-linear time to do so, and this quasi-linear time is really important because if you try to tackle a, um, a hard problem, then this little overhead doesn't hurt very much, right? So I'm happy to spend one second additionally if overall the inference would take 10 minutes. Um, so um, that's pretty, pretty nice. So as said, our main motivation was to get a general understanding and just show you can do that um, in general. Now I really would like to tell you that I think this is only the tip of the iceberg. So what is happening right now is that there's a lot of new interest in why should we only look at sparse matrices? Why can't we make use of all the cool data structures out there developed in other subdisciplines of AI and make use of them for optimization? So here you see one idea. Um, if you anyhow deal with a probabilistic program, most likely you can easily compute a pass tree for your formulas. Now with that, you can easily build what, we, uh, what is called an algebraic decision diagram, or you can even go for um, affine versions of them and uh, more extended versions. And now you would like to code your optimizer like in an interior point solver using these data structures instead of sparse matrices. So imagine you have a matrix full of ones. In a sparse matrix, you are screwed, right? I mean, of course, you can subtract and keep the one in mind, but otherwise you are screwed because there's no zero. And the algebraic decision diagrams, you get that for free and everything collapses to a single node. Now the only problem is that 
Um, you can't apply the standard techniques. So if you go for a Cholesky factorization, for example, the decision diagram explodes again. So you have to think a little bit um, and check out literature, and there's a lot of interesting stuff on metric-free optimization where you never materialize your whole matrix. And if you use those guys together with these decision diagrams, you can get speed ups of five times for free. So I'm just saying old code, our old algorithm, with a new implementation, you get speed ups. Um, so I think, again, we can say probabilistic programming is great. But yesterday, and also, to be honest, when checking many of the posters, and maybe also including our ones, I feel really bad because I'm not sure that I'm so much into statistics that I can really talk to you. It's really, really hard, I think, if you're not an expert and you don't want to push the next NIPS papers, but you would like to implement that in a, in a company, um, if you don't like Poissons and you don't like generalized gammas and you don't like distributions. So um, Josh was already referring to the um, statistician, to the automatic statistician. Um, super cool stuff, but I think they mainly focus too much for now on regression. So our idea was, can we, so, can we have something like the automated uh, Judah Pearl in a sense, right? So can we have a system <laughs> that is coming up with a graphical model if you have tabular data? <laughs> So, of course, idea is, can we make use of deep learning? Can we put it into the stack? And here's one problem, at least for me, that standard neural networks are not really faithful probabilistic models, right? So what we did here is uh, we train on MNIST, and then we evaluate on other data set. But you can use your favorite image data set. So you can have dogs and cats, and then you show a tree, and the system will tell you, yeah, it's a cat, right? That's the main issue, because it can't tell you, I haven't seen that. Um, you know, um, so um, can we do that somehow differently? And if you look at, there's a long tradition going back to Adnan Darvish and maybe even earlier on arithmetic circuits and, and variants of that, where you also have very much like in TensorFlow and in deep learning, the idea that you come up with a computational graph and now tailored towards probabilities. So your activation functions are essentially plus um, and product, right, sum and products. So very simple, you just put your input in here and then you compute. So different is only that you typically get only one output, which is the probability of your joint um, um, state there. But otherwise, everything is very much the same, and you can even do um, structural learning in a very simple way by making use of, for example, non-parametric independency tests if, you're, if you want to be agnostic to your distribution, and then you always try to split um, random variables into independent groups. If you can't find independencies anymore, you do clustering or random splits to do a local conditioning, and then hopefully in the next iteration you can find um, again, some um, independencies. So now still, although simple, it takes a lot of time doing the structural learning. So what we did this year is to come up with a, like a random forest idea, but now for some product networks, which is essentially building these different um, region graphs, in a sense, randomly in a way that you can still make use of tractable inference. And what is happening here now is that you can run the same experiment, and then you see on MNIST you get this... Um, probability mass only for MNIST and for the other ones, of course, you still get a probability, but people will tell you or the system will tell you, hmm, I have never seen this, this kind of pixel arrangement, so I'm a little bit um, um, unsure and I don't want to tell you with high probability that I have seen that. Uh, here you see that you can then automatically compute outliers and so on, and this is all naturally built in, right? It comes, comes for free. <coughs> you can also do now learning with non-parametric independency tests if you now do the base distribution in your leaves, also in a non-parametric fashion, and here, for example, you just use histograms, very simple. Um, you can also learn on data sets where at least I don't know the distribution. So that's the Alzheimer data set, and I'm not sure what is the distribution of satisfaction at work. I mean, I'm satisfied, so maybe it's a um, big uh, probability mass on being happy. I don't know, but in general, I don't know the distribution there really, and particularly if you then take also time into account and so on. So it's getting really tricky, but then generally it's still a problem because you would like to know it's a Gaussian, it's a Poisson, it's a generalized gamma or whatever. So that's why we now also combined these some product networks with more traditional um, Bayesian models, and particularly the one by Zubin in Isabel on trying to identify automatically the statistical type of a random variable, and because they're both probabilistic models, you can easily combine them, and you get a system that can decide, 
at least in the language of distributions you're interested in or a family of languages you're interested in, decide on uh, what is the most likely distribution used there, but they can also, they can, the model can also tell you the confidence, right? It can tell you, well, I think it's a Gaussian up to a certain probability, and I think it's a Poisson up to a certain probability. And then because it's ever, anyhow super trivial, it's a, it's a keep in mind inference is linear in the network, you can also easily build up now kind of grammars that turn your probabilistic model there um, into text, describing what is interesting, how much variance is explained by which subpart of your network. Um, you can compute in a tractable way many explainable techniques. Um, so you get this now what we call deep um, notebooks. So in a sense, instead of starting with an empty Python notebook, you can start um, with a pre-programmed by the machine um, notebook so that you understand already a little bit your data, which is typically quite important. Um, so again, if you want to try out, you can download the code. Um, I also would like to emphasize that um, this is all by compilation. So I should ask Stuart whether this is the form of compilation he had in mind for Brian. Um, but it's really that you code because whether you have a symbolic representation or you put it into C code, that's just a different language, right? So you really compile into C code or you compile into specific languages, for, for example, FPGAs. And for at least our models, uh, we are um, up to 10 times faster than TensorFlow, which is maybe because we are not, we're having rather sparse models, the higher up in the hierarchy. But I'm, I'm just saying maybe we can do much more with FPGAs. Second, I would like to emphasize that I think we can have deep, deep learning that can quantify in a natural way their uncertainties. And just to illustrate, of course, we are not there. We are one group, but I hope we can encourage you guys. But to, just to show you that we can do similar stuff that you know from deep learning, on the left-hand side, you see now pixel SPNs, not pixel CNNs, right? And SPNs can also generate um, images. Of course, here it's still uh, gray images, and we will add color soon. It's just a question of um, um, computation. And on the other hand, you see attempt infer repeat models where you can speed up just by using SPNs. Um, it's about, I don't know, 10 times faster. So what is the future? Um, yeah, I should put that. Um, I think we should really work more on symmetry-aware deep probabilistic learning. I think we should, uh, which I discussed not with you, um, Stuart, but with he van der Broek a little bit, I think we should have open universe mathematical programming. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if we talk to uh, financial people, um, they, they do it wrong, right? They always assume that they know the population. And I think that would be super, super interesting, having strong interactions with statistical mathematical programming. And um, at the poster, you can talk to Carl, to one of my students, on some product probabilistic programming, at least the idea that we have there. With that, I would like to thank you. And again, I'm complaining, and I hope I have not uh, bored you to death. And I just want to remind you guys that all this business is really making money. So um, companies are putting millions into that. Um, and I don't like that it's always only said um, deep learning was generating so much money with 500 million or whatever the numbers were with DeepMind. We are in a similar um, situation. So I can only encourage everyone and to just enjoy and push this field. It's amazing, and so thank you for organizing this conference. If you are, oh wait, one minute. If the final message, sometimes it's hard to publish papers because you need a right high diverse background in, in judging our papers. So that's why we start, uh, started a new journal as an add-on to the standard machine learning and AI journals. And that's with the frontiers. You can think about frontiers, whatever you want to think. But anyhow, I can tell you it's an it's a easier way of getting maybe some papers accepted, and in particular on reproducibility, which I think is really important, and we should play a major role there. Thank you, guys. Um, uh, we have time for one question, and then we're going to make a brief schedule change to accommodate uh, uh, the rest of the day. Okay. Question? Yes. Uh, really great talk. Uh, could you provide a bit of a roadmap for SP Flow in your mind, like how you're thinking about the project? It's a really exciting project. So um, I'm not sure whether officially I'm supposed to tell you that, but uh, we are currently trying to force uh, to join forces with Uber and other people. Um, 
So right now the debate is more like, so we, we will also compile, we, we have it already, but it's not pushed um, to PyTorch. So, and we would like to have a more general um, um, domain specific language. So I think it's happening more, but um, I'm a little bit more like what um, other people told me. I think we first have to show in some applications that it's really worth doing it, and then the rest is coming. Um, but yeah, we are, we are standing on the shoulders, hopefully, of some other companies, yeah. Thanks so much, Christian. Thank you.